gets it off in time. And he's got it, baby! Big time Nets win! The only, what, the only Nets fans you know. Man. I mean, come on, Look man. Or are these guys? Welcome back to the Only Nets Fans You Know podcast. I'm Peter. Welcome to episode number 68, Hunter or Hunted. Today, I'm joined by Mike from MTN Nets Podcast. What's going on, bro? What's up? Thanks for having me. This is actually my first time doing a guest appearance on a Nets podcast. So this is a first and I'm excited. So it's a lot to talk about, obviously. But let's just jump straight into it, man. Kevin Ali era. We're here. Two practices in the first game within 72 hours. 121-93. Nets get killed. Nets give up 50 points in the paint. 46 fast break points. Have 32 turnovers. Well, what do you think about the game? Well, I came, I came into it thinking it was going to be a close down to the wire type game. And I, I think the spread said the same thing. I think it was like Raptors by one and a half. So watching the game, yeah, they got off to a slow start. I, I think the offensive possessions were a bit more organized and there was a bit more of a plan, but the shots were just not falling early. And it took them a while to get Cam Thomas involved, which kind of annoyed me. But, you know, we got back to 19 points by the end, shooting 50 percent. So, like, I'll take it. But. Yeah, it's something in the second quarter, not second quarter, but like the second half, fourth quarter specifically, they were just lost. And the spacing with Ben and Claxton, which is an issue we've had now for <laughs> over a year, um, it's not going to get solved. And this team clearly does not have enough shooting. And as you said, there's a lot on Ali's plate. It's a, it's a whirlwind for him right now. And like, you know, there's only so much you can do in that amount of time um, to expect the team to look completely different in that span of time. is just not reasonable. I thought the effort was a bit better, which is, I think, what we're all looking for at this point. But to go out and lose by this many points to a, a Raptors team that I think is pretty much on their level, it's it's disappointing. And I think, you know, once again, this is a team you're fighting for with a playoff spot. I don't know if they're going to make the playoffs at this point, the Nets. I don't see it unless they expand to 11 or 12 teams, but that's not going to happen. So, um, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot to work on. It is one game, so I'm not going to be too harsh on Ali, but we'll see what happens to remaining 27, but who's counting? We had Bridges putting up 21 points, 7 of 16 from the field. Camp Thomas had 19 points, four assists. And I think the next leading scorer was Lonnie Walker at 11 points. Uh, you had Ben Simmons playing 21 minutes putting up only two shots, very <laughs> disappointing, obviously. Uh, the real, I guess, mess, you could say, as far as the box score, yet CJ and Dennis Schroeder both shooting one for seven. It's not looking good for CJ right now. I kind of feel like he's uh, been exposed a little bit. I feel like the team kind of sold him as a power forward. I, I don't know what you think about that, but that's just my take on that. It's It's reasonable to be disappointed by him so far, of course, being paid that much money and – I just think the Nets have way too many guys to do the same thing. I think we all know this by now. Like, I feel like you look at, well, when Royce O'Neal was here, Royce O'Neal, DFS, Mikhail Bridges, like just a bunch of guys that do the same stuff for the most part. And I was hoping, you know, Cam Johnson, based on what we saw in the playoffs last year, where he was arguably the best and most consistent net last year, it was only four games having being swept. But I expected more this year, and so far he's looking more like Alan Crabb than someone who's looking more like prime Joe Harris, which I think was a, uh, you know, we're kind of hoping for. Obviously, Joe is not remembered that great here based on his playoff history, but Joe Harris during the regular season was a great net, and I was hoping that Cam Johnson could be somewhat of that, but even a better defender because I do think he is bigger and more athletic, but so far it has not worked. And I feel like his confidence is shot right now. I don't know how they get it back. They're trying to bring him off the bench, which, hey, I don't mind that move. Let's change roles and see if it fixes anything. But he's been bad. I got to be honest. He's been bad. And I do think, like, I want to be fair. I feel like if he had a point guard, like a real point guard, he'd be much better and not having as much responsibility as he does because he was always used to being, like, the fourth or fifth or sixth option on a good team. Now you come to the Nets where there's not that much talent and you're supposed to be the third or fourth best guy on this team. And he's just not that kind of player. So I feel like if he was put, if you put Cam Johnson on like the Milwaukee Bucks, he'd be a great fit or something like that. But right now, just given our situation, this is just not it for him. And I'm hoping that in these final 27 games, once again, he can one, stay healthy because that's a big thing, but two, gain that confidence back because 
you know, not that they're going to trade him for sure, but he might be a guy based on that large contract that could be flipped for a potential star in the offseason. But even if he's not flipped, I just want to see the guy play better because he's under contract for, what, three more years? I see CJ more of a small ball four, like really small ball four, because he can't rebound. Last year, the <laughs> analytics showed that he could be a good off-the-ball defender. The numbers in Phoenix showed that he was a good defender. You know, I, I'm not sure if he has the speed to kind of catch up to the, uh, you know, faster small forwards. I'm not sure if he has the size to bang with the bigger power forwards. So he's kind of uh, kind of a tweener, right? Yeah. But I will say this. I'm going to defend him a little bit, all right? He did have a hamstring injury coming into the year. Hamstring injuries are the fucking worst. <laughs> they linger. They affect the rest of your body. And having something like a hamstring injury the first month of the season can carry over months later. I, I don't know if it's that per se. And the Nets are paying him to be the guy who he's going to be or hope he's going to be next year or in the year after rather than the guy he is right now. But I do think he needs to have uh, we need to have a little more patience with him. But I totally get why Nets fans are livid because right now it looks like we're uh, we're kind of dealing with the Alan Crabb contract <laughs> sort of deal again. Right. Right. So, what did you think about the trade uh, the trade deadline? It was a little underwhelming. I think some of us, or maybe a lot of us. I mean, yeah, like if you're grading it, it's probably like a C. <laughs> like it's somewhere where it's like, eh, like it could have been worse, but it obviously could have been way better. Um, but I, I think a lot of us fans at this point want to just rebuild. And um after like my what I wanted after the deadline was to have more of a um What's the word I'm looking for? Just like clarity. more clarity. Yes. On like the direction of the team. And I, I feel like I left that deadline, not really getting that they traded two expiring players. One of them, like, I feel like the Schroeder for Dimwitty trade. Yes. Schroeder is under contract for next year, but are those two like that different of players? I feel like they're on the same tier of point guard. And then you look at Royce O'Neal, where was he going to resign here anyway? So you might as well get what you can get. So I don't leave that trade deadline thinking like, oh, well, they're definitely going to rebuild or, oh, they're definitely going to go star hunting. Based on their quotes and stuff, they're obviously going to go star hunting. But I wanted to see more of like a, a drastic move, whether that, you know, they were not going to trade Mikel Bridges, but maybe Claxton was shockingly traded. And now they're in a tough situation with Claxton because if he walks for nothing, that's going to be a bad look. I think Clax is an unrestricted free agent, which makes it even, you know, more uh scary potentially so um yeah it was a disappointing trade deadline and you know we'll get to sean marks i'm sure that's a whole different discussion but it's just crazy that he's still here and i was just hoping for more Let, let's you know you brought it up let's let's get into it <laughs> i have to say i've been a huge supporter of sean marks my uh my faith kind of waned a little bit this trade deadline I, I i will say that i had a lot of people like in my ear saying, come on, man, like, how, how many coaches is this guy going to hire? How many playoff series are we going to see, like, you know, with no results? And I thought he bought himself a lot of faith with the first couple of years, obviously, because you know what? The guy fucking deserved it. The guy got us, you know, you could say, man, KD and Kyrie, they were going to come anyway. But you know what? The guy put us into the position to get there, and you have to give him credit for that. Everything after that, though, there's lots of stuff that you could say about letting assets depreciate, you could say a lot of stuff about him not being able to build a complete roster, a balanced roster, and not going for the guy at the right time. The Harden deal, say what you will, you do that 99 out of 100 times, and if you tell me right now, Mike, that you don't do it, you're a fucking liar. <laughs> I agree. I would do it too. I mean, it was scary because like it's James Harden, but that team, I, I feel Marks is kind of... I do feel bad for Marks in a way. There's things about him I'll get to that like I'm disappointed with and definitely his fault. But the man, his resume could have been so much better than it's going to be because I feel like a lot of what happened here was just so unlucky. Like he would have brought us a ring if not for the 2021 playoff injuries. Like all they needed was just two of the big three to stay healthy. And unfortunately, that couldn't even happen. So th there's that. And then like the vaccine mandate, is that really Sean Marks's fault? Like I can't put that on him. Um, the thing that always bothered me with Sean Marks was that in a pivotal off season, which was 2021, he let go of Jeff Green, 
Landry Shamit was traded, I think, for Dayron Sharp or something. The draft pick that led to Dayron Sharp. Um, so you let go of some key bench pieces that offseason and replaced them with like DeAndre Bembry and James Johnson and washed up Paul Millsap. Like that was a massive offseason for Brooklyn. And like they needed guys that can contribute. And yeah, Bembry and James Johnson had their moments, but neither of them ended up on the playoff roster anyway. So it's just like that was such a big offseason for this team. And if he really nailed that offseason, then maybe that prevents Harden from leaving and they have more depth and they could have won more games and not have gone on that 11, 12 game losing streak that year when, you know, stuff hit the fan. So there's things like that with Marks where I'm like, yes, you could have done better. But ultimately, if it wasn't for the I like to say it's like the 99th percentile of bad luck that this team has had recently. If it wasn't for that, this guy probably at least brings us a championship. And for that reason, like it's hard for me to say, oh, he's completely a terrible GM because that team on paper in 2021 was probably one of the best rosters to touch an NBA floor. It's just unfortunate how it you know unfolded. What were the chances that you would have three Hall of Famers on your roster and then you have a worldwide pandemic? Yeah, like, what, what, what yeah. are the chances? It's only this <laughs> franchise. This franchise may be cursed, but that's another story for another day. I got to ask you, though, what do you think about Sean Marks' contract? Is he, <laughs> is there a contract? Is there not a contract? I know it's supposed to be released if there is a contract signed, but I, I would not think it's the craziest. This is my little conspiracy theory. I'm going to paint this picture, okay? Dark right. room. We're at the training training center, HHS. He has a piece of paper, a pen, just slides over a paper. Sean Marks looks at it. He signs it. But Joe Side does not put it in to the, the league offices. Why not? <laughs> well, why wouldn't he? Because of this. Could you imagine the mum that would happen right now if it was announced that Sean Marks had an extension? People would go crazy on Twitter, <laughs> even more that they have. I that's my little conspiracy theory. You could, by the way, you could not do that with players. Obviously, you would lose draft picks. But when it comes down to front office, I don't believe there is any uh, CBA rule that would stop that from happening. Technically, what do you think I, about that? Yeah, I'm not even sure about all that. Like, I guess it could be a possibility because, as you said, if if it was released to the public, there'd be a lot of backlash about it. I don't know what to think. I mean, I, I kind of list as I, you know, we we're going to talk about the Scott O podcast with Brian Lewis. And he was talking about how this is the first time in like all of Sean Marks's tenure that he's unsure about his job security. So I, I look at that and I'm like, eh, like maybe he'll be let go. I think it's reasonable. I feel like Marks has had plenty of time to, you know, show who he is by now. And I, I do think Joe Sai, I've heard people say this and it makes sense. Joe Sai is probably looking at this like, hey, a lot of this was the superstars' fault or it was bad luck, as we just mentioned. And maybe Josiah wants to give him like a clean slate and say, you know what, Sean, you built this thing up once before. Let's see if you can do it again. But I'm at the point personally where like I'm not too, too anti Sean Marks, but I've just reached a point where it's like it's just time for a new voice, time for a new vision. Um, after a while, it just gets stale. And it's just I feel like it's reached that point, you know, like he's came in here. As we said, he's done some great things, put together a great roster. Unfortunately, it didn't work out. But I think at this point, especially since you're getting a new head coach, most likely in the summer, it's a great time to get a new GM and head coach on the same page. And I'd prefer more of a player development type head coach or something like that, and even a GM. But it, once again, it depends what direction they're going in the summer. And I don't know what Sean Marks is saying to Joe Sy or what he knows about Joe Sy that is keeping him employed. Maybe Sean Marks has this amazing plan for the summer that he sold Joe Sy on, but I don't know what it is. I, I don't know. Maybe in the summer he will be gone, but it's just a wait and see at this point. A lot of people are surprised he's employed, and I can't blame them for thinking that way. I saw this tweet from Scoop B. I think this is exactly what it is. So I'm gonna I'm pulling this up right now. This is a, there's a conversation going on about Sean Marks. Someone asked, you know, how does this guy still have his job? So Scoop says this. Think about it from this perspective. When you're at your job and your employer slash boss is comfortable with you and the work you do and the pedigree that you come from, Sean Marks is a blessed man. God bless him. I I think that kind of that kind of seals the deal at least for me uh, of 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 the thinking that Josiah might be having 
because I, I look at that and I analyze it. Man, that makes a lot of sense. That really makes a lot of sense to me. Talking about the Scotto podcast, I thought one very interesting thing was uh, was the talk about Jeff Peterson and about the possible shakeup in the front office. Jeff Peterson is like a star in the league. Uh, I think we got we got him from Atlanta a couple of years ago, right around the start of the 7-Eleven era. He's an up-and-coming front office executive. Mark's number two after Trajan Langdon left. And uh, there's talk that they might have Mark's move into the president of basketball operations and then have Jeff Peterson go into the GM role. Well, what do you think about that? I don't know too much about Peterson, but when I've heard him spoken very about... Very well liked. Very popular. Exactly. Organization. Yeah, very so popular. Like, um, when I heard the idea of promoting Sean Marks, quote unquote, to like the president of operations and then putting um, um, Peterson... Is it Peter, Peterson or Patterson? I already forget. Peterson. Peterson, putting him at GM. Like that... I don't know about that. Like, that's crazy. If you promote Sean Marks after all these years, like I, I get you're trying to keep uh, Peterson on, like, on board and that makes sense. But I don't know. It, it kind of reminds me of like that Seinfeld episode when they promote the mailman because they're afraid to fire him type thing. Like, it's just I, I can't can't get on board with that. That's a bad look. So, listen, it's a, it's they got to make a tough decision. And I think. Joe Sai has to do what's right for this organization. And as we said, like he's had plenty of time. I think Marks has been here for seven or eight years. He's been here since like 2016. So enough is enough. I think if Peterson's that good, then let him be the GM. Let's let's see his vision. What does he have in the store for this franchise? So, you know, I'm not, as I said, I'm not super anti Sean Marks. Like if he stays here, it is what it is. I, I do personally think it's time to move on. But if he's here, he's here. Um, as you said with the Scoop B uh, tweet or X post, um, you know, maybe they are just comfortable working together. I feel like everybody that talks, yeah, they talk about this like, oh, they're in lockstep and, and whatnot. And like, maybe that's true. But then you hear other people kind of speculate otherwise. So we're all, we're going to find out this summer. It's going to be interesting. I'm, I'm excited to see what A, the direction of this team is and what moves are made and B, if Sean Marks is even the GM for that. So, uh, I'm not going to say um, I'm going to let you guys on a little secret or whatever, but <laughs> but I, I want to uh, want to ask you a question, okay? Mm -hmm. Mike, who's the Nets president of basketball operations right now? Right now, who is it? It's probably Sean Marks, isn't it? So what? So what are we doing? <laughs> he's, just, he's already the president of basketball operations, basically. You're he's just giving it a title, governor. <laughs> guys. This would just be a move to keep Jeff Peterson. It's the same thing. Yeah. It's the same thing. That mm -hmm. There's no difference. There is no, I don't think, I might be wrong. I don't think there is a president of basketball operations. Sean Marks is the guy who's in control. So there would be no difference. Maybe he would get a raise. I, you know, whatever that may be. I don't know. But let's, let's get into the roster right now. Man, you touched on, on Nick Claxton. And that is such a polarizing player right now. He's going to be a free agent. 24 years old, having a good year, per se. Um, I say per se because you have a lot of the fan base that loves him, and then you have other a part of the fan base that says, man, this guy's getting bodied on the, on the inside. But both sides cannot deny he was a defensive player of the year-esque guy last year for sure. And uh, I, I, I asked Mike Scotto what he thought about, about like his uh, Nick Claxton's next contract I talk to people in analytics. They think he's going to get $25 million plus. I had wow. last year someone told me a max deal. And I believe it because you know what? These GMs love analytics. And the guy's 24. How often do you see a 24-year-old defensive player of the year on the open market? It doesn't happen. It doesn't True. happen. Well, what yeah. do you think? Did it, oh, it is guess, a Scotto, Scotto did say, I got to sorry to interrupt you. Scotto did say he thinks it's going to be under $25 million. Well, that's Take good. that as you will. That helps me sleep at night. All right. <laughs> um, Claxton's a difficult player to evaluate because I feel like with better coaching, like let's say Ime Udoka did take the head coaching job here last year. I feel like that would have played up Claxton way more, and he would have been a guy who was close to a max contract type player. 
I feel like with this team, whether it was the drop coverage on defense, which took away his best ability of playing perimeter, like on ball defense and switchable defense onto guards, like we've seen Claxton do that for years. I remember that game from like three years ago against Portland where he was clamping Dame Lillard um, above the three point line. So this guy can do it. And there's some games with Claxton, like I would say like once every four or five games, Claxton has this amazing performance where it's like, 16 points and five blocks and 12 rebounds and he like doesn't miss any shots because most of them are dunks anyway but you're like oh my god this guy is so good and then there's some matchups where it's, i feel like specifically those boston matchups on the back-to-back um last week before the break like he was invisible in those games and like even last night for the most part too i'm trying to look at his stats quickly he had six points he eight uh, ten rebounds i mean wasn't that great of a game so there's too many times for me with claxton where he will go invisible but there's times where it's like oh my god he's great so it's really matchup dependent for him but if you really had a defensive minded head coach that knew how to use him the correct way his value would be a lot higher so maybe like in a way it is like i think if the nets let him walk for nothing that would be dumb like don't let an asset like that leave if you can sign and trade him to uh, memphis or oklahoma city then like maybe you do that, but please don't lose that guy for nothing. That's a good asset at 24 years old. So, and another thing is like, I wish they let him shoot more. It's a, another debated topic because I feel like a lot of Nets fans want to see him shoot and he can shoot. Like that was the thing when Kenny Atkinson was here, they were letting act, uh, they were letting Claxton shoot. And obviously he didn't play much that year because he was a rookie. But when Kenny was here, he at least I remember his debut game. He shot that wing three pointer. He made it and it was all great. We're like, oh, my God, this 6'11 guy can stretch the floor. And it feels like ever since Steve Nash came in here, and I don't know if it was Nash or if it came from Sean Marsh or whatever, um, they have not let him shoot the ball. And I know he's been playing with a lot of superstars during that time, but we're we're at a point now where it's like, hey, if he's open in the corner for three, like, can we take it? Like, we saw him make that one against the Suns a couple months ago, and that was awesome. And we saw KD give him that look. But um, he can shoot the ball, and so can Dayron to a degree. So I I just wish they would let these guys – you know, spread the floor more because Lord knows we need that. But for some reason, they're just not letting it happen right now. Uh, I think people forget that Claxton was a guard in high school. Can he expand on that in, in his game? In three years, he's going to be 27 years old. He's going to be just entering his prime at 27. How much can he add to his game between now and then? Especially if we resign him. I, I would say a lot. No? Yeah. Um, it depends. I don't think he'll ever be somebody that's going to score 20 points a game. I can't see that type of ceiling, but I just feel like with that defensive versatility, he can become such a valuable role player, like a very, very high end role player, like kind of like it's a different position, but the way Celtics fans view Derek white, how he's been so great for them this year on both sides of the floor, like maybe Claxton could be that effective to a degree, just not shooting and all that. But You know, just a very high end role player. I don't see Claxton ever being a guy taking you off the dribble and making like a a 20 foot jumper. That's probably not going to happen. But a guy who can make his set shots and can hit threes in the corner, I think he can expand to that level. But if you're expecting Claxton to do anything off the dribble, it's probably not going to happen. There are those rare cases where he'll just take the ball from, you know, baseline to baseline and dunk it. But in terms of being like a creator and a a shot maker off the dribble, it's probably not going to happen. But I think he can get a bit better from what he is right now. Two things that stuck out to me in in addition to the Claxton information. One, Brian Lewis wasn't too sure about Ben Simmons ending the year as a net last year. I thought that was really interesting. And two, which was shocking to me, Ryan Lewis said the Nets may want to add one or two stars next to Mikel Bridges. What do you think about both of those things, especially Ben Simmons? Because let's face it, star hunting and Ben Simmons, they go hand to hand. That $40 million expiring contract next year is the key to everything as far as the cap sheet goes. Yeah, we won't have a problem with that because we have Ben Simmons contract. We have Cam Johnson's contract. Like we have a lot of big tradable contracts. Um, yeah, I'm I'm over the whole Ben Simmons thing. Like I there is no chance he's ever returning to the guy he was on the Sixers. And it's a shame. Like I I, I feel bad for him because I don't think it's like he, I don't think it's him not trying or him not caring. I think the guy's genuinely hurt and he just has not had confidence in his body 
honestly, since being a net, like ever since that trade was made. So, you know, you have that factor and I'm personally just like, I'm done with him. Like if they want to get rid of him and get anything, then I'm fine with it. If it's just a salary dump, like we did with Joe or, um, or Patty Mills last year, I'm fine with that too. But if they can include Claxton in a trade to get, you know, enter star players name here, then that's fine with me too. So I'm just over the, uh, the Ben Simmons thing. And it sucks. Like you watch him play last night, watch him play uh, last night. It's so frustrating. Like the guy is six ten, and we saw him like, you know, body somebody out of the way. He did that against the Spurs too uh, recently. And like, it's there sometimes, but it's just not consistent. And the guy can't make a foul shot, which doesn't help either. So, you know, unfortunately for Ben, it's just like, he's just a massive contract at this point, And he's just not a good basketball player. Like he's not, I feel like he kind of helps the Nets, but kind of, you know, kind of. You don't think, no, 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 time out. You don't think they're <laughs> a lot better when he's in there? Come they, on. they were when he first came back, but I just think watching them the past four or five games with Ben, I just like, are they that much better? I, it just hurts the spacing too much. Really, if if Ben Simmons played with like Carl Anthony Towns as his center, I think it would look a whole lot better, but they just don't have the roster for it. Like, you cannot play Claxton and Simmons together. You cannot play like even Dorian Finney Smith, I feel like, hasn't made a three in two months. Like, the guy has not shot the ball well recently. So, you just can't play him with certain players. If you put Ben on a better team and surrounded him with more shooting, I would say absolutely. Like, that could work. And you know, to a degree, you're right. Because when Ben came back those first two games, the Nets scored like 130 something and 120 something, and it looked great. But ever since then, it's kind of been like blah, and there's no spacing. And I feel like teams have figured them out. So at this point, I have no confidence that it's going to work out that great the rest of the year. I, I think that's all fair. And I think there is something to that uh, Claxton and Ben Simmons spacing. I don't know if the answer is starring Schroeder, which a lot of people have talked to me about. They think Schroeder should probably be starting and then put Ben, you know, kind of separate, separate Claxton and him. But I, I don't, I really don't know if that's the answer. Having a point guard that would give just a little more spacing, I think would really help out Bridges, would really help out CT and, and it would just help out the whole offense as, as you know, in, in general. But I can't deny that this guy, Ben Simmons, defense and rebounding on the fast break, he does help the team a lot. And I do think there is something to that. Uh, I just don't know if he could do it for the whole season. Who do you think they replace Simmons with if they do go for stars? Just kind of looking at the landscape, just taking a guess. Is, is there a player that you think kind of catches your eye that might be a good fit for the Nets? Yeah, there's a lot because they need everything like the, the Nets need absolutely everything you can get right now. Um, you know, at first I was going to start with like DeJounte Murray, but I, I really do think if the Nets wanted DeJounte Murray, they could have had him at the deadline. I think any He's team could have. And, you know, I don't blame them for not getting him. Like, I, I think he would have been a good fit. I do. But like, I don't know if you want to spend because he does have a long term contract. and He does make a good amount of money. So I could see why they didn't want to do it. But like. It depends. Maybe they have their eyes set on a bigger target. Like, I do think D names. Yeah, D-Lo, too. That would have been funny if that happened. Oh, my God. He's been playing pretty well, I feel like, too. But um, the three names that come to mind for me are Trey Young, Donovan Mitchell, and Carl Anthony Towns. But I, I think Scotto said this in Spaces last night, and he's right. Like, you can't really answer these questions right now until you see how these teams' and seasons play out. Like, if Minnesota and Cleveland – get out in the first round, yeah, there's a much better chance that those guys do get traded. And for Trey Young, I feel like the Hawks are not going anywhere anyway. Like They'll probably be the 10 seed, and they'll probably just get out in the play-in tournament. So, you know, I'm not too concerned about that, but the Hawks seem like they at least want to trade one of those guys. I guess for some reason that pairing has not worked out. So even if they do trade Trey Young, I feel like the Nets may be a good destination for that. But you know, it's an in-conference trade and, you know, the Nets and Hawks are kind of near each other in terms of talent. Would Atlanta want to even do that? So there's a lot of questions that go into it. But there's always, a, as you said, there's always a surprise. Like, I remember that year, and this was a different age at this point, but when the Nets got Darren Williams, like, I feel like his name was not out there. It was just like, oh, I, 
I, I, I still had an Envy at the time or a Blackberry, so I didn't know what the hell was going on. And I, I walked into the bathroom in middle school and I, I saw the text and I was like, oh, my God. So it's just a lot of crazy stuff can happen like that. So you never know. I mean, maybe a name like that comes along. Um, we saw Giannis sign his extension, so probably not him. But could there be a, a big fish out there that maybe comes available? I don't know who that would be. But as you said, you never know in this league. It's very unpredictable. Who's going to be the coach next year? Oh, <laughs> Uh, I see Budenholzer's name out, out there a lot. I don't know how I feel about that. I feel like a lot of Bucks fans did not like him, and let's just tell it how it is. If Katie's foot was two inches back, he's probably getting fired that year and not a championship coach. So, you know, I know there is that connection with him and Marks with the Spurs, but then again, is Marks even going to be the GM? I, I don't even know. So there's a lot of question marks here. Um you know, people talk about that assistant coach on the Nuggets, and I would not mind it because that's a young guy who's been with a great organization. Um, kind of reminds me of like what they did with Kenny Atkinson. Like, get like a younger guy has not coached in the NBA before. As Another a, one that has not coached in the NBA. Another guy. I mean, Kenny. Nash. We're doing yep. it again. It depends what direction they go in. If, they're, if they are getting these stars as they they think they are, then yeah, I would probably just go the. I don't know if Budenholzer is the right name, but a, a veteran coach, a guy who's been there before. Um, we can talk about Nash. I mean, that decision was, uh, you know, I think based on reports, it was, you know, people love depending on Katie or Kyrie, but I think it was Sean oh, Marks that wanted him. Yeah, it, it was Sean Marks who wanted him. So that was just an awful decision. Way, I'm cutting you off right now. That is Marks' worst sin. You think so? The worst one? Absolutely. You have Katie, Kyrie. You bring in Steve Nash. I understand great working relationship. They're boys, but you know what? You needed a veteran coach. You fucked up. Yeah, they did. I think they just wanted a babysitter. That's the worst part. There's always that quote of Kyrie saying like, oh, I don't think we need a head coach or I don't see us yeah. having a head coach. And like that, that was a killer right there. We should have known right then and there, this was not going to work. But um, yeah, if you can go back in time and change that, they absolutely would. I mean, I was kind of having an open mind at that point because I always figured like Steve Nash could have been a good head coach, like based he was such a high IQ player and whatnot. He's well respected. He had the relationship with Durant and Golden State. So you figured like maybe, but you know, I, I thought after 2021, like maybe he's a decent coach, but a lot of that was masked by Ime Udoka and Mike D'Antoni being on the bench. And when those guys left, we saw who Steve Nash really was, and it just did not work out. But yeah, I wish I had an answer as to like who I think will be the head coach. I really have no idea. Like they, they should have, they should cast a wide net. That should be a big thing. Like they have not had a real head coaching interviewing pro uh, process since like 2016 when they got Kenny, I believe. Right. So it's been a very long time. And cause I feel like they brought in Nash and I feel like that was kind of predetermined. And then with Jock Vaughn, it was like, he was the interim guy that they just prematurely gave an extension to for some reason. So they haven't had a real head coaching um, interviewing process in a long time. So that's what I want to see. I want them to interview as many guys as possible. And, and whether it is the player development guy as a first time head coach or the veteran guy who's ready to coach Donovan Mitchell and Carl Anthony Towns or whatever it's going to be, um, you know, we'll see who that is. But I, I do want it to be based on what the roster is. If the roster is ready to compete, get a veteran. If it's a young roster where you trade bridges for Jalen Green and do some other stuff, get a young player development type coach. Yeah, uh, I saw all the names that they listed from that Scotto podcast. Chris Quinn, Sean Sweeney, who was, a, who was an assistant for Jay Kidd uh, when he was coaching the Nets. Chris oh, is, he the, is he the guy with the gray hair? Like the, the short guy with the gray hair? Uh, kind I have of? no idea, to be honest. I feel like I've, I've like, seen him. I know you're. I, I know who you're talking about, yeah. though. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I have no idea about the head coach either. I have a feeling it's going to be a name that's not mentioned yet for some reason. I don't know why, but uh, but yeah, I, I, we got to start wrapping it up a little bit early today. So I'm going to start going in, into the outro. I got to ask you: the Nets make the playoffs if. I kind of told you this before. If they if they expand it to eleven teams, make it from each conference. <laughs> <laughs> um, I really I don't think they will. But if they sweep Atlanta, which I think they play them back to back in a week, they do. I'll give it some hope. I think they have to go like a little over five hundred. I would say you know finish out the year. Uh, I'm trying to do the math in my head right now. Like maybe 
if it was 14 and 14 or something like that, or, you know, so, something like that. I, I don't know what it would be exactly, but a record where it's a little over 500, right around 500. Cause I think the Hawks will obviously drop some games. They're not that good of a team. I think 10 seed is the best case scenario though, for this team, which is sad to say, but it's true. Favorite Nets Jersey slash. This is one question. What would, what throwback would you like to see next year? We're putting that as one question altogether. I love those jerseys last year they had. It was the city edition, I think, and they were white and they had like these different paint designs on them. They wore them in 2021 too, but those were black jerseys. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So they, you know, they wore the white ones last year. I was a big fan. I have a hat over there that's uh, the same colors. It's awesome. So um, I love those jerseys. Um, I wrote them down too. I want to see. There was. I like the 1819 jerseys where it was like the designs. It was like the Biggie Smalls colors or something like around the, uh, yeah, yeah, there were, there was that. And I, this is back in New Jersey, but I, I love the plain white New Jersey Nets jersey, the home jersey. Big fan. I want that to come back. Like they tried the whole New Jersey Nets thing a couple years ago, which a lot of us referred as to like the curse of jerseys because a lot of bad things happened in those jerseys that year. But they brought in like the blue Nets jerseys. I want to see like the plain white blue Nets, you know, logo across the chest. Like I do miss that jersey. Yeah, man. Okay. This is possibly the most important question of the whole podcast. I got to fix myself. Okay. Are you pro or anti Swamp Dragon? Oh, <laughs> as like the team name, like officially change it. No, just like as an alternate. Like, well, what do you think about the name? I don't think I love it based on. Well, oh, if were, no, you're wrong. If you're they were playing, saying, if they were bro. playing in, if they were in Jersey, if they were in Jersey, no. still, uh, if they were in Jersey, I would say sure. But the it, podcast it's Brooklyn over. Swamp Dragons just would not work. I'm oh, sorry. No, no, no. I'm just saying like a, like a maybe alternate Jersey. I'm saying sure. like the idea of a swamp that's, you know what I mean? Just. I just play around with every guess with that one. That's fair. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it just wouldn't work in Brooklyn. I feel like if you oh, were in Jer- if you were back in the swamp at Izod, I would say, yeah, maybe. What but- about an alternate, an alternate swamp dragon night? What do you think about that? Swamp dragon. Purple everywhere. Yeah, that'd Purple be cool. It'd be weird because we're like a you know a would black be. and white that's color team, but it'd be interesting. I'd be down for it. All right, Mike. Let's get some plugs in there for you, bro. Uh, yeah, you can find me on X, Twitter, whatever it's called, uh, Mike underscore NYY. I just complain about the Nets on there a lot. Um, I do the podcast and YouTube channel, MTN Nets Podcast. And for the NFL people, I run a regular YouTube channel that's Mike Too Nice. And that's pretty much all I got. There we go. All right, guys, you can find me at NetFans, you know, on Twitter, on YouTube. I'm going to be dropping at least an episode of maybe, maybe even two episodes a week. From now to the end of the season, if you like the episodes, please like and subscribe. If you guys are enjoying your lunch right now, enjoy your lunch. If it's the weekend, enjoy your weekend. Whatever you guys are doing, be safe, have fun, and let's go Nets. We're out.